Hello, it's Scott Manley here with another set of Deep Space updates because I think that's what we're calling this by now. I want to start with Hayabusa, which is Japan's spacecraft orbiting a small asteroid called Ryugu. At the start of the month, it deployed its SCI, that is a small carry-on impactor. And what it is was a projectile weapon, a shaped charge that would fire a slug of copper into the asteroid to make a crater so they could sample the interior. Now this was a very delicate maneuver. Uh, the spacecraft obviously didn't want to be in line of sight for this because debris could fly off and hit the fragile spacecraft. So not only did it deploy the small carry-on impactor in, its, uh, in an orbit so that it could fire at a later time, uh, it also deployed a camera, DCAM, deployable camera, which would photograph the whole thing. And then, of course, the spacecraft moved to the far side. It fired, and just today, it was performing maneuvers to get down close and find the hole that it made. So now we have an image showing the plume of ejector coming off the asteroid, which is cool. But we now have this uh, great image of the the damage to the surface and it's great I mean you can see the interior is darker you can see the displaced material and of course once they've checked this out they are going to send the uh, spacecraft down into this to collect a sample because it's going to return a sample of pristine asteroid material to the earth you know, by next year so that's pretty amazing that they've got this. They also have a sample from the surface and uh, it still has another couple of robots to deploy, but great going there, Hayabusa. And now we go to Mars where InSight has been collecting data and this week published the first evidence of a Mars quake and we actually have an audio recording of it, which is pretty amazing. So previously they sent seismometers to Mars on Voyage, on the, sorry, the Vikings, and the Vikings, uh, they had issues with the wind. So of course, InSight came up with this uh, seismometer, which would sit directly on the surface of Mars and then have a wind cover over the top. And so that increased sensitivity has now enabled them to detect a very weak tremor but it's the first one. I mean, look, I live in California. We see these things popping up in the alerts all the time. They're nothing. This is on Mars where nothing has ever been detected before, but it's the first evidence that Mars is currently geologically active in some way. So uh, that's great, but they also have uh, some updates on their mole. If you remember the, um, the heat penetration package, was supposed to burrow down like 16 feet into the surface and you know figure out whether there was heat coming up from the interior. Uh, after they started doing this back in February, the probe got stuck about one foot down, about 30 centimeters. And they have been very carefully trying to figure out what's going on with it. Now, they're not sure whether the probe is stuck in the uh, you know in the launch hardware and the deployment hardware. They're not sure if it's sitting up against a rock or a hard gravel layer. They have actually been running the hammering action. It's kind of like a self-driving nail. This thing it goes bang, 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 knocks its way down, and they were they've been running it and trying to collect seismic data with the seismometer to see if they can ascertain what's going on. They've also got teams working in simulated labs that like um, at JPL they have the in situ instrument lab where they basically test hardware on simulated Mars and in fact I was there at JPL when I was driving to SoCal Doug Ellison gave us a tour and we could see people working on the simulated version of the um, insight it's it's really kind of cool to see this going on um, so yeah that still hasn't got any further they still haven't made any decisions as to what they're going to do with it. You know, there's some uh, suggestion that they can hold the arm on top just to add extra pressure. There's some people saying they might need to move this, but that's a, you know, they are a long way from home. And if anything breaks, they can't fix it. They can't send anyone to fix it. So, you know, understandably, they're moving slowly. The spacecraft is going to work quite uh, well for a long time. Meanwhile, for the spacecraft that didn't work so well, Dragon 2. The story hasn't really changed since my quick impromptu video. The main thing that's changed is we don't think the Draco thrusters are directly, or sorry, the Super Draco thrusters are directly responsible anymore. Um, 
there was there have been some comments from like the aeronautics space advisory panel or sorry aeronautics safety advisory panel and um, various NASA people saying that they have faith in SpaceX. We've confirmed that the testing was done on the pad and that they tested the regular Draco thrusters and then they were going to test the Super Draco thrusters and that's when something happened. And there was a leaked video which uh, you've probably seen elsewhere by now. It is awful. It is like a 144p resolution, 10 frames per second. And then on top of that, the frame is flipped, you know, into portrait mode and has big black bars down the side. So there's only like <laughs> tiny, tiny resolution on this, but it's enough to show that we see what looks more like a big cloud of white material, white cloud or whatever, it casts a shadow if you look very carefully, which means that it's not a white hot explosion. This is like a cloud of vapor for the first couple of frames and then it explodes. It happens very, very rapidly. It also appears to be centered not on one of the thruster pods with the Dracos, but somewhere in between. And this is evidence to me that it's not the Dracos firing, it's something to do with the way they are integrated into the spacecraft the fuel, the propellant, uh, the pressurization system, that would be what I, I think is going on here. There's no evidence that they had begun to fire the engines. There's no like smoke or anything coming out of it. This thing basically went from perfectly fine to a big blast. And that to me says a failure in a highly pressurized tank. Now, the Super Draco thrusters have a chamber pressure of 1000 PSI, according to Elon Musk. And that means, of course, that your uh, monomethyl hydrazine fuel tank and your dinitrogen tetroxide tank both have to be pressured to a higher level than that. And these are both pressurized by a helium tank. So that helium tank even needs to be even higher pressure than that so it can push all the fuel out and the fuel and the oxidizer. So I mean, it's not unreasonable to have these things maybe at like 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 PSI. And the truth is that sounds like a lot, but actually tanks, similar tanks that flew on the space shuttle, they were pressurized to even higher levels. So it's not out of the realms. And I know that SpaceX has had terrible problems with COPVs. Like their two big rocket failures were both uh, precipitated by events related to their composite overwrapped pressure vessels. That's the word I've been saying, COPVs. Um, and, and, you know, there was a lot of talk about how NASA was getting SpaceX to change their designs because they were concerned. And that wasn't because the design was inherently unsafe. It was because they were putting these inside liquid oxygen tanks. And that had never been done before. And of course, by doing this, they discovered an entirely new failure mode, which involved carbon fibers breaking under tension and causing a spark that would ignite the lining of the, the exterior of the tanks. That's, you know, crazy failure. And yeah, this does seem to me like a pressure vessel of a similar sort breaking for some reason. And I mean, obviously, they've done a lot of testing on all these systems. They know these things are well within their limits. But when you integrate all this stuff and you have to make it work for the launch escape system, the launch escape system is supposed to fire at full thrust for something like seven seconds. And to fire at full thrust, a Draco engine needs about 31 kilograms of propellant per second. So, yeah, eight of them, that means 250 kilos of propellant per second, which you have to push down the fuel lines to get there. When you're moving that much fuel that quickly, you have to start and you get worried about things like transient pressure rises from the momentum of the fuel. That's what's called the fluid hammer. Uh, so... I, I don't know, they're still looking at it. This is, of course, was a test, so it was highly instrumented. They would have pressure sensors, temperature sensors, all sorts of sensors. Wherever they could have a sensor, they would have a sensor, and they probably have a ton of data to go through. They're not gonna be debugging this based on that crappy cell phone video that everybody else is trying to, you know, read something into. Um, but, I mean, the other good news, of course, is that SpaceX is actually continuing with their planned launch of CRS-7 which is very direct evidence that NASA has a lot of faith in them and also that the Draco thrusters weren't involved because the Draco thrusters are on both the Dragon 1 and the Dragon 2 and you know you would think if there was anything related to that 
then they would obviously suspend the flight. Uh, an interesting thing about CRS-17, which is going to launch next week on uh, April 30th, uh, it would normally land at the landing zone, the booster would. And because, of course, there is now an investigation there where they might be picking up pieces and they might also have to decontaminate it because, you know, MMH is kind of nasty stuff, uh, they're instead going to land on a barge just off the coast. So this is going to be a great opportunity for people to actually see what a barge landing looks like. If you can get in the right place, you might be able to see it. Um, if you get if you're a little further away, you'll be able to see the rocket landing on the other side of the horizon, but still see the top of it. So, yeah, it's a great place to bring your flat Earth friends. And just as SpaceX seems to have had a bad run of luck with their pressure vessels, Elon Musk seems to have had a bad run of luck with their 420. I mean, there was that whole tweet about taking Tesla private at 420. They had the whole smoking pot and getting investigated uh, and then they had this Dragon 2 test failure which happened on 420. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I should point out that CRS-17 is supposed to launch at 422, so missing it just by a couple of minutes. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe. <laughs>